IFF Affiliate Leadership Training Summit and Human Relations Conference. I would also like to welcome at this time those watching via live stream this morning from their station houses. Welcome and thank you. My name is Patrick Morrison. I'm Assistant to the General President for Health, Safety and Medicine and your moderator for this session this morning. Today you will hear from two subject matter experts for our Toxic Substances and the Firefighter Workshop. They will discuss the impact of these toxic substances on firefighter health and safety and the legislative efforts underway to address them. Shannon Meisner is the Director of Governmental Affairs at the IFF. She serves as the IFF Chief Lobbyist to the federal government. She has worked for the IFF for 14 years and previously served as a professional staffer in the U.S. House of Representatives for seven years. Raquel Siegel is an occupational health specialist at the IAFF with a master's degree in public health. Over the last three years, she has assisted the IAFF with research, technical assistance, and advice to affiliates as they relate to health and safety problems, questions, and concerns. Her main focus includes flame retardants, PFOS, and other occupational chemical exposures. At the end of this session, we will also have a Q&A segment. Our live stream this morning is brought to you by E18, our in-house video production team. So to begin this session, let's please welcome Raquel Siegel. Good morning, everyone. So again, my name is Raquel Siegel, and I'm the Occupational Health Specialist at the IAFF. Before we dive into the chemicals of concern, we just want to sort of set the stage as to why so many chemicals are concerned for firefighters. And this is because of occupational cancer. It is the largest health concern facing the firefighter profession. And we're seeing that contaminants from the fire ground are being brought to the station. And a lot of these contaminants are linked to cancer. And we're seeing this every year at the Fallen Firefighter Memorial. And this year, this September, over 70% of the names added to the wall are a result of occupational cancer. So the first chemical we're going to discuss today is perm polyfluoroalkali substances, or PFAS. I'm sure many of you have heard about this, and it's probably the most difficult chemical we're going to discuss today. So to start, what are PFAS? or PFAS, and I'm gonna try my best to say PFAS so we know we're talking about the full class rather than a specific chemical in the class. So to start, PFAS is a class of over 4,700 man-made chemicals, and these are classified by the carbon fluorine bond, which is the strongest bond to break on the molecular level, which is why it's used for a lot of water repellency and uh, non-stick surfaces. So the long chain PFAS chemicals are probably the ones you've all heard about the most. This is your PFOA and your PFOS. So the long chain just means that it are, this version are the C8 chemicals. So it's classified because it has eight carbons in the molecular structure. So it's long chain and this includes your PFOA, your PFOS. PFOA has been used in AFFF foam and in consumer products in the nonstick uh, products and stain resistance. PFOS has been used in your AFFF firefighting foam. So the thing to know about these is that from 2005, or 2006 to 2015, through the PFOA stewardship program, eight major manufacturers have actually shifted away from producing these products. And this was a voluntary phase out. And so because of that, PFOA and PFOS are not manufactured by those eight major manufacturers in the United States. They are still manufactured internationally, and they can still be brought into the US through those products. Um, so because they're no longer made in the US, we've seen a shift to the C6 chemicals. And so these are considered short-chain PFAS chemicals. And these will include your Gen X and your PFHXA. And these are what are currently used in your consumer products and in AFFF firefighting foam. So the thing with them is that they're viewed to be safer because they can pass through the human body a lot faster, but there's limited research on them and they do have a similar structure as the long chain PFAS chemicals. So there is a potential that there could be similar health risks to the C6s as well. 
So to break it down a little bit more, the PFAS family is classified into two main categories. You have your non-polymers and you have your polymers. The best way to think about this is to think of a volleyball net. The volleyball net is going to be the cell membrane of a cell in your body. Your non-polymers are small, a low molecular weight, and they are, um, you can think of them as a golf ball. They're able to pass right through the volleyball net and they can cause damage to the cell. Your polymers, on the other hand, are large molecules. They have a high molecular weight and you can think of them as a volleyball. They're really big, they're unable to pass through that cell wall. So think of that analogy as we kind of go through the whole class of PFAS to really understand the different exposures and the potential health risks associated with them. So under your non-polymers, again, these are your small golf balls, you have your PFOA and your PFOS. And it's been determined that they do pose uh, health concerns. But we also see the C6s fall into this category as well, which are used in your new uh, AFFF firefighting foam. And because of that concern, we're also starting to see the shift away from, this, uh, from the C6s to fluorine-free foam. So, and that is a result of the fact that it could have the similar health effects as the long chains. Under your polymers, again, these are your large molecules. These are your volleyballs. Under this category, you have your PTFE, which is used in your moisture barrier. Um, it's also used in medical devices in human bodies for over 40 years. This also includes your nonstick Teflon pans. And then the other category is your side chain fluorinated polymers. And these include your durable water repellent treatment and textile finishes. So the thing to know about the side chain fluoropolymers or fluorinated polymers is that they do contain C6 in them but they're not standalone as, a, as the non-polymers. So the way to think about this is a non-polymer in this form is one train car. But when you look at the side chain and your durable water repellent, it's multiple train cars and the C6 is one car in that full train. So it's too large, it's a big molecule, it's now a polymer, it can't pass through the cell membrane. So that's kind of the best way to look at the two classes is that they are a little bit different, they have different properties, and it really does base on if they're a non-polymer or if they're a polymer. So now that we have a better understanding of the class, where can we actually find PFAS chemicals? And we've talked about them in your nonstick uh, cooking pans. We've also, um, they're in your food packaging materials. So think about your pizza boxes, your popcorn bags, your fast food wrappers that wrap your burger. Anything that could contain grease in it, you can think those packagings most likely have PFAS chemicals in them. They're also used in your durable water repellent for upholstery, furniture, uh, clothing, and carpeting. And of course, in your outer shell in your durable water repellent treatment. And then PTFE is used for your moisture barrier and for medical devices. But that's not it. They're used in so many other consumer products. They're used in personal care products, cleaning products, obviously your AFFF firefighting foam, uh, paint lacquers, and so much more. So the big question kind of comes as, what are these necessary uses of PFAS? There are some purposes that are needed, and then there are some that it's not quite needed. Like, do we really need it in our dental floss? Not sure. Do we really need it in our cleaning products? You know, so these are kind of the way to look at it is like where are the necessary uses and not necessary uses. So now when we take a look at the turnout gear, we've already mentioned it, it's in your PTFB of your moisture barrier and your durable water repellent on the outer shell and sometimes on the other layers as well. So it could be added to your moisture barrier depending on what products you actually purchase. But the thing to know about these is that these are all the polymeric forms. These are your large volleyballs, the ones that can't pass through the cell membrane. And they are required to meet the protection of NFPA 1971. So this is what's protecting you from your liquids, your oils, your bloodborne pathogens, and your heat. So this, when you look at it, where they're added at this point, your PFAS uh, chemicals are needed to meet the NFPA 1971 standard. So when we take a look at some of the health concerns, a lot of the research is primarily focused on contaminated drinking water to your non-polymeric forms of PFAS. So again, these are your golf balls, this is your PFOA and your PFOS. And so when you're, um, so with the research being focused more there, it's a little bit limited for us to fully understand some of the occupational exposures. We know that you're getting it from the AFFF firefighting foam. 
Uh, we've also talked about it being on upholstery furniture and on carpeting and other uh, household products. So it possibly in the combustion byproducts of when you're responding to a fire and these materials are burning. And then it can also contaminate your PPE. So again, your exposure routes are going to be through inhalation, ingestion, and dermal absorption. The dermal absorption we know is from your AFFF firefighting foam. And so when we talk about the actual health concerns and what PFAS is linked to, the research again is primarily focused on your contaminated drinking water and to the non-polymeric forms. And so a lot of it is from your AFFF exposures or from you know, the West, uh, West Virginia uh, chemical plant. So, you know, these are a little bit limited and there is a need for more occupational research to better understand the, the chemical exposure to firefighters specifically. But the health concerns here are kidney and liver disease, immunotoxicity, thyroid disruption, kidney and testicular cancers, cardiovascular disease, and ulcerative colitis. So the IFF is doing a number of research projects that I'm going to talk about later on in this presentation. Um, but there really is a need for more firefighter-specific occupational research to better understand our exposure from um, all the different routes of it. And now I'm going to pass it over to Shannon to talk about the legislation. Thanks, Raquel. Um, so again, I'm Shannon Meisner. I'm the Director of Governmental Affairs uh, at the International. So I am essentially your lobbyist uh, in Washington, D.C. So I will deal with the Congress and with the administration on all of the issues that we are talking about today. So I want to walk you a little bit through what we've been doing on Capitol Hill as it relates to PFAS and what we see moving on this issue in the next year. So as Raquel pointed out, we are very concerned with the um, exposures to firefighters of PFAS um, for the health implications. But at the same time, there's been a lot of interest on Capitol Hill in this issue. Um, based on uh, results of testing in communities across the nation that have found contaminated groundwater. So we see a lot of this, especially in the Rust Belt. We see a lot of it in the mid-Atlantic and, um, excuse me, uh, northeastern states. Michigan and New Hampshire are particularly impacted, as is New Jersey. But additionally, anywhere that you have a military base, you see um, high levels of contamination in the groundwater for PFAS. And that is due to the um, uh, AFFF foam that is used on military bases. So there is really not a corner of this country that does not have some um, uh, concern with PFAS contamination. But again, the uh, larger um, uh, areas of concern are in the Rust Belt and the Northeastern states. So. This interest that we're seeing from legislators is very bipartisan, and it's due to the geographic nature of this known contamination. Um, you do not have, this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is an issue that is impacting the constituents of your elected officials, and so they want to see solutions, and they want to see it fast. Um, and again, as I mentioned, military bases at some of the highest levels of contamination in 2018 um, DOD actually did a report that named, I think, 401 contaminated military bases across the country. So military families, veterans are impacted as well, thus the high level of interest from your elected officials. Mm. So as a result of some of these tests that are coming back, um, and as well as a result of some of the ongoing research that's going on, EPA in 2016 lowered the lifetime health advisories for um, PFOA and PFAS, uh, the golf ball size again, uh, in the drinking water from 200 um, parts per million to 70 parts per million, right? So you think about what that is, that's a significant decrease um, uh, in the amount of permissible chemicals in the water. And um, again, um, uh, so many public drinking water systems have been revealed to be contaminated, um, even um, and especially with this lower, um, this lower threshold. So unfortunately, despite this, this good um, action by EPA, EPA is very limited in what they can do, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency. 
1996, a law was passed that requires EPA basically to show that any contaminant they regulate is dangerous and demonstrate how setting a limit um, offers meaningful opportunity for risk reduction. They also must justify it financially. So there are limits on what EPA can do. In this space, Congress has decided to act by passing new laws, and states have also decided to act by passing new laws, which we'll get to in a minute. This is a really text-heavy slide. I apologize, but there's been a lot going on on Capitol Hill in the past year and a half on this issue. Um, we uh, at the IAFF have been on Capitol Hill for the past couple of years talking about exposures to firefighters, talking about the impact that it has in your health. Um, and really um, started in earnest on this in 2018 when we went to Capitol Hill and testified before the uh, Senate uh, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee on this very issue. Um, shortly afterwards, we were successful in working with a coalition of others to get language included in a bill called the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018, which would allow airports to transition away from PFAS-laden foam. Previously, airports followed MilSpec, which is the requirement at military bases, and used basically the PFAS-laden AFFF. Um, uh, and this law basically specified you don't have to do that anymore. You can transition to fluorine-free foams. This was possible in part due to efforts overseas in Europe um, where that transition has already begun and has shown to be successful. <clears throat> Um, shortly thereafter, we began to work on a variety of other legislation. Um, we're very proud of the next uh, bill that I have listed here, the Protecting Military Firefighters from PFAS Act. Are there any federal firefighters in this room? Yeah, there's a couple of you. So this is original IAFF authored legislation um, that we wrote in uh, conjunction with uh, two of our friends on the Hill, Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire and Senator, or excuse me, Congressman Norcross of New Jersey that would require blood testing of uh, DOD firefighters at their annual physicals. So we know that when tests are done, that firefighters' blood does show contamination with PFAS. This hopefully for federal, or for federal DOD firefighters is going to allow them to understand what that baseline level is in their blood systems so they can have conversations with their doctors so they can make sure to lessen their exposure and make the right decisions for themselves and their health. And again, we know that federal firefighters are um, heavily impacted by this due to their exposure from AFFF foam at military bases. We've also been working on a variety of other um, provisions which we moved through a bill called the Department of Defense Authorization, which um, mostly impact our federal brothers and sisters to uh, help reduce the exposure of AFFF. Um, and there were a lot of pieces that were included in a bill that became law just in December. Um, essentially, that bill will eventually um, ban all firefighting foam containing um, PFAS from uh, training at a military bases, um, ban the uncontrolled release of PFAS foam for any purpose other than putting out fires, uh, require that DOD uh, publish a new non-fluorinated military, yeah, military uh, foam specification by 2023, and eventually ban the use of PFAS foam by 2024. Um, so we're very excited about that. It's a little bit longer time frame than we would like, um, but uh, it does set us on the right path. Um, additionally, this same bill authorized an additional $10 million to study the impact of PFAS on health. Um, and we're very excited to announce that shortly thereafter we passed a funding bill that actually provides that funding. So we will be having an additional $10 million to study the health impacts of PFAS. And then um, additionally, $2 million to study PFAS in personal protective equipment, which is huge. Um, as Raquel said, we've been doing um, some studies, but the federal government has not studied um, this issue in particular before. To, so to have $2 million earmarked on this issue specifically um, is really great news for firefighters, and we're excited to have been a part of that. In the coming year, this issue isn't going to go away. Um, just two weeks ago, Congress started again to consider more PFAS legislation 
um, the second bill on this list, HR 535, to consider uh, that, a lot of acronyms here. PFAS considered hazmat under CERCLA. Um, basically, it's the Superfund law. Um, and what that would do is it would allow communities to get more money uh, for cleanup purposes, as well as um, making sure that folks are aware of the um, toxic chemicals that are in their communities. Um, that was passed by the House just two weeks ago. Um, it was previously included in legislation that was moving last year, but unfortunately stripped out. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily going to be moving quickly over in the Senate, but we are talking to folks about it. The other legislation that's on this list, um, a couple pieces I want to point out. The first one, the Guaranteeing Equipment Safety for Firefighters Act, would um, study turnout gear. Again, half of that's done through the money that we got in that bill I mentioned a minute ago, the $2 million that was included in the omnibus funding bill. But this, um, this 2525 would also provide funding for researching PFAS-free alternatives in your gear. So we are looking to get this done as well. Um, there's also legislation to consider PFAS hazmat under the Clean Air Act. Again, another way to get at the same thing, to uh, regulate this chemical. And then um, assorted other legislation relating to guidance to firefighters who use PFAS foams, which is on its way out, um, as well as guidance to firefighters on PFAS generally. That's the federal perspective. Um, now I want to switch to the states for a minute. So there's not time in this presentation to go through each 50 states, each of the 50 states and tell you what's going on here. So I'm trying to give you a snapshot as we go through each chemical. You'll see this map time and again. This is actually from a really great website um, that everyone should check out. Um, it's uh, safe, uh, Safer States, Safer Chemicals. Um, they have really great resources on your specific state laws and everyone should um, give it a look when they get a chance. Um, this map here shows laws that have been adopted already regulating PFAS. The green states are states that have some level of legislation on this issue. Most limit or ban foam, right, in some way, shape, or form, either banning it outright or limiting it for training purposes or banning it in certain applications. Um, some limit or ban PFAS in packaging, and then the remaining are relating to water testing and cleanup. So uh, after this class, if you want details on any of this, come see me, and I'll help get you what you need. There's 18 states with proposals on the table, green states here. And most of those um, proposals are again, about banning or regulating PFAS-laden foam, reporting discharges, uh, labeling PPE containing PFAS or considering PFAS as hazmat. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Raquel so we can move on to our next chemical, which is flame retardants. Thank you. So flame retardants have been a concern for firefighters, and unfortunately, they remain a concern for firefighters. So let's sort of talk about why this is. So flame retardants were originally added to slow or prevent fire growth in uh, homes and businesses and places like that. And in 1970, California passed Technical Bulletin 117, which required that for any uh, furniture to go into the market, it had to meet the open flame standard. In order to meet that standard, they essentially had to add a ton of flame retardants to the products and that is why they were added. So this started in California, but because the market in California is so large, we saw the trend go across the entire United States because manufacturers are gonna make one product and then they're able to continue that same product everywhere. So because of that, because of this TB117, uh, a lot of the furniture in your hotels and in public spaces now have flame retardants added to them. And over time, flame retardants have been determined to be toxic, and some classes have been banned. And when we refer to a class of flame retardants, we're referring to the actual chemical in them. So when we talk about brominated flame retardants, we're referring to the flame retardants that have bromine in them, or chlorinated have chlorine in them, or organophosphoric ones have phosphorus in them. So when Shannon talks about some of the state legislations, or I mention them, we're, and we say something like a brominated flame retardant, you know that, that all the flame retardants in that class contain that one chemical. 
And traditionally, brominated flame retardants have been the most abundantly used flame retardant in consumer products. And we're starting to see that the trend in a lot of the state legislation is that they're banning that specific class, in addition to others, but that is one of the main ones that's been determined to be very toxic to humans. So because of TB117, we're seeing flame returns used everywhere. We see them in upholstery furniture. We see them in mattresses. We see them in consumer product electronic casings, fabrics, vehicles, construction materials, and children's toys. And I tried to check under the chairs in this room to see um, if they had the label for TB117. Unfortunately, all the labels are ripped off. So we don't know what's in your chairs. But <laughs> if you flip over some uh, upholstery furniture, it might have the label on it that says TB117 on it. And then you'll know that it most likely has flame retardants added to it. But we've seen a shift from TB117 as California passed TB11713. And that went into effect in 2015. And essentially that shifted from an open flame standard to a smolder test, which allowed manufacturers to use less or no flame retardants at all. So since 2015, we're starting to see that trend. And again, California is so large, they passed this, it started there, and we're seeing it across the US now. I just ordered a chair from Amazon. It came, I flipped it over, it actually had TB11713, and next it was checked, no flame retardants added. So these products are on the market now, and it's very exciting. And there's a lot of big manufacturers who are really starting to change as well. So places like Ikea and Ashley Furniture and Crate and Barrel are starting to, or have removed flame returns from their products. So these big manufacturers are places where if you want to avoid using them in your home, you can start to buy them and actually fill your home with safer products. So even though we've seen the shift to safer products without, P, uh, without flame returns in them, Unfortunately, there's a ton of products that are probably in your home, in your station, in hotels, and anywhere you go that still have flame retardants in them. And as research has come out, it's starting to show that flame retardants aren't doing quite what they say they're going to do. We're seeing that they're actually making fires more toxic. They're making the smoke thicker and, uh, harder, to, uh, and uh, harder to see, a lot darker. And they're making it harder for firefighters to actually do their job. And through the, um, the toxic smoke results in a number of exposures. We're seeing that there's inhalation exposures. We're seeing there's skin and contact absorption exposures and inadvertent ingestion. And these exposures are because these products are burning. When you're, when you're responding to a fire, all these upholstery furniture, mattresses, other consumer products contain these toxic flame returns in them. And when they burn, they're contaminating your gear, your equipment, and if you're not deconning and you're putting your contaminated gear into your cab, when you return, you're now bringing these flame returns back to the station. If you're being detailed to another station, you can contaminate your car, bring it home. So these flame returns we know do travel. So it's a major concern that there's so many legacy products on the market and in all these uh, homes and buildings that you're going to put fires out in because this is a concern for, for our health and safety. Um, so when we talk about the health effects, we've mentioned that uh, you know, there's a multiple routes of exposure. And flame returns have been directly linked to endocrine and thyroid disruption, impacts on the immune system, reproductive toxicity, cancer, and neurologic function. So in order to really combat this, the best form is to decon your gear. You want to make sure you're not bringing contaminated gear back to the station because, as I mentioned, it does travel through the dust. You are bringing it back. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in some of the research we've done. But so deconning your gear and not bringing contaminated gear back into the cab is one of the best ways that you can protect yourself from continuous exposure to some of these toxic flame retardants. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Shannon. Thank you so much. All right. So I want to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about some of the legislation that's moving on flame retardants. Um, to start out, I just want to say there's been a real concerted effort by stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean folks in the labor movement, including the IAFF, folks in the environmental movement folks in the consumer movement, right? 
to work on this issue over the past several years, and it has made a very real and tangible difference in the use of toxic flame retardants in everyday life. Um, especially, if, and as far as legislation goes, this is very true at state level more so than at the federal level, although that's starting to change a little bit. Um, the chemical has been almost entirely eliminated in furniture and baby products. Um, and as Raquel said, um, it remains ubiquitous, unfortunately, in a lot of other products. As far as the firefighter perspective goes, this is problematic because when you respond to an event, when you respond to an incident that uh, involves fire, and you have byproducts of combustion, um, you have these old furniture pre um, the new uh, standard with fewer flame retardants. You have older household products, right? And then you are exposed to the flame retardants when that catches fire. So for firefighters, um, these legacy products remain a very significant problem. Um, thus far, again, another fun map from saferstates.org. Um, we have 14 states that have adopted laws which limit or regulate toxic flame retardants. Um, you're going to see on these maps that a lot of the same states are passing, uh, a lot of the same states um, on each chemical are passing laws um, that relate to these toxic chemicals. Um, and that's due in part to the hard work of interest groups, including uh, local IAFF state associations on these issues, um, as well as other stakeholders in those states, as, as well as um, just a, a, a progressive mindset among the state legislators and governors on these issues. There's 19 states with proposals on the table. Um, this is a more interesting um, selection of states. Uh, we will see how far some of those proposals get. And when we talk about state laws, um, a few trends we see here, banning very specific products, right? And I have them listed here. I'm not gonna pronounce most of these chemicals. I'll leave it up to Raquel. Um, you know, so banning these chemicals outright, prohibiting the sale of certain products containing toxic um, flame retardants. So specifically, children's products, bedding, furniture, those are very popular um, uh, categories that we see pro prohibitions uh, with, and certainly some of these, like children's products, it's hard to argue against. So states have been successful in passing those bans. And then labeling, again, Raquel mentioned the tags on the chairs that have been ripped off. I think that's illegal. Um, but if you go home and look under your couch or on a pillow, you might see these labels that she was referring to. So a lot of these laws, um, back here two slides ago, well, okay, it's not rewinding, um, are related um, to uh, labeling. Um, and if you want to review any of these slides or follow along as you go, um, it, our, our uh, presentation is posted on the app. So if you wanna refer back, to any of these maps, you can do so there. At the federal level, uh, the main law that deals with flame retardants is TSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act. So this was legislation that was a long time coming. Um, there, basically, um, the legislation requires EPA conduct ri risk assessments and regulate hazardous chemicals. And they had a choice of a number of chemicals that they could um, regulate, and um, in, uh, shortly after passage of the law, EPA chose 10 chemicals that they wanted to study, one of which was a flame retardant listed here. I am not going to pronounce this. I'm calling it hexadeca bad stuff, um, but this is a many year process. Um, but basically what Tosca did is it started this process of EPA examining this flame retardant hexadeca bad stuff, seeing, and then um, as a result of their initial studies, um, they will see uh, how they wish to regulate it. The IAFF has been engaged in this process. Um, we do support regulating this chemical, hexadeca bad stuff, and there's two things we argue, argued in particular. Number one, um, that firefighters are a vulnerable subpopulation, right? So firefighters especially are exposed to this toxic flame retardant when they respond to the fire ground, when they encounter this chemical as a byproduct of combustion. 
And then we also argued that um, the EPA needs to evaluate legacy um, flame retardants. So flame retardants that have been, again, um, this chemical that's been in furniture in previous years, not current use, but rather chemicals that were put in furniture 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they need to evaluate regulating those products. Um, additionally, uh, Pat Morrison, who started off the uh, presentation here today, has been testifying on Capitol Hill on this very topic. Um, so uh, unfortunately, EPA rejected one of our arguments. They rejected legacy evaluation. Um, they said that that was not within the scope of what they wanted to do. Um, there was a legal challenge to that. Courts decided to side with the IAFF and others um, that EPA should um, uh, do a legacy evaluation, and uh, right now we are in limbo waiting to see if anyone challenges this further. But as of today, EPA must um, study uh, legacy, um, uh, the legacy evaluation of these chemicals. Um, there's another piece of legislation that is moving. This one I actually think has a chance of um, getting passed into law this year. SOFA is what we call this bill, the Safer Occupancy Furniture Flammability Act. Um, this reduces the use of toxic flame retardants by adopting the California standard, right? So it adopts that modern smolder uh, flammability test standard that Raquel spoke about during her presentation. Um, we're excited about this because it has gained traction in the past two years since it's been introduced. It's even been sponsored by a conservative Republican in the U.S. Senate, um, and so we've been working on this for a little bit. Um, it passed the U.S. House just before the Christmas break in December, and we anticipate that shortly after the Senate finishes their um, impeachment proceedings, uh, they will return to normal business, and this is one of the uh, bills that the Senate uh, may be considering uh, in the coming year. It has already passed a Senate committee, and we're excited to see this move forward and hopefully um, be able to uh, become law by the end of the year. So stay tuned for that. And at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Raquel to talk a little bit about asbestos. Thank you. So the final chemical we're going to address today is asbestos, which just like flame retardants has been in the firefighter environment for a long time, and it's going to probably stay in the environment for a long time. So what exactly is asbestos? It is a class of, or it's a group of six different fibrous materials that the US government actually recognizes as dangerous. So this isn't just one fiber, it's six out of, there's a bunch of fibers that are under asbestos, but there's six that they actually classify as the dangerous forms. And from the 1930s to the 1970s, asbestos was widely used for its fireproof abilities. So it was really great at that, so they used it in ceiling tiles, floor tiles, insulation, wrapping pipes. It was used in a ton of different uh, building products, and so, there's a, a ton of houses and buildings that still have it in there. So as they started to use it, they started to learn about some of the toxic properties of it, but they come to find that asbestos unbothered is not toxic. So, well, these are air walls, but if you have a real wall and it has asbestos insulation in it or ceiling tiles with it, as long as they remain completely intact and unbothered, they pose no health risk at all. As soon as you punch a hole through that wall or it catches on fire or the ceiling tiles start to crumble, these fibrous materials now become friable. They break off, they become airborne. And these airborne uh, fibers are what actually cause a lot of the health concerns with asbestos. So we talked about asbestos being used a lot. And the EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency, actually says that there's over 700,000 buildings in the United States that still contain asbestos. That's a lot of buildings. And we don't know all the buildings that actually have it in them. So you can sort of assume that a building built between 1930 and 1970 probably has asbestos in it, if you can tell what those buildings are. Um, but there's no way to know for sure. There's no database that says these buildings have it, these ones don't. So you can kind of assume that going into any old building 
there's that potential that you can be exposed to asbestos and the fibers. And especially since it's burning um, and you have to go in and, and tear down walls and ceilings and everything, you are going to be exposed to these fibers. There's no way to avoid that. So consequently, asbestos will be in your environment for decades to come. There's no rule that says that uh, the asbestos needs to be remediated from all buildings. So they're going to stay intact until, there's, until it's identified and, and then they have to remediate. Also, um, asbestos is not banned in the United States. So there's different industries that have banned it, but for the most part, while it's not still being used, it doesn't need to be removed from everything. So as I mentioned before, that when the buildings are burning and you're going in, you're performing overhaul activities, and you're tearing down walls and you're tearing down ceilings, those are some of the main exposure routes. So a lot of times when your gas monitors go off, especially during overhaul, you say, oh, no more gases in the air, let me take my SCBA off. It's too heavy, I don't wanna wear it. Well, that's one of the main exposures is when you take it off during those activities because those fibers are becoming airborne and you're going to inhale them then. So your gas monitors are only, are only telling you when the gases are fine or the levels are fine, but they don't tell you anything about the particulates in the air and the asbestos fibers. So it's really important to know that that is one of the main exposure routes for this um, contamination. So on top of that, it's also going to contaminate your gear. So, and, and it can get onto the equipment. So especially when you're gross deconning, if you take your SCBA off during gross decon, another chance for you to be exposed to the fibers. And then obviously, like flame retardants, if you're not cleaning your gear and you're putting contaminated gear into your cab, you can then take the fibers back to the station. If you're detailed to another station, you can contaminate your car, your home, the other stations. So these fibers move really easily, and they're really toxic, and they're really tiny. So as I said, your main exposure route is inhalation, but there's also inadvertent ingestion or your hand to mouth. So again, asbestos is not banned and there's no safe level for it. So a little concerning. Uh, and we're seeing some of the, the main health concerns are kind of fall into two categories. You have your non-cancerous, which are gonna be your asbestosis, which when you inhale the particulates, they can cause scarring on the actual lungs and that can result in shortness of breath, coughing and chest pain. The other non-cancerous disease is going to be your pleural changes or pleural plaques. And this is the scarring of the lining around the lungs. So that results in the same things, chest pain, shortness of breath, and coughing. On the other side, you have your cancerous diseases. And these are gonna be your lung cancer, so cancer of the lungs, and then mesothelioma, which is cancer of the, of the lining around the lungs and the abdominal cavity. So mesothelioma is a, a more rare cancer and is directly linked to asbestos exposure. So if somebody develops that, they has that tie. And according to the NIOSH firefighter study, firefighters have a rate of mesothelioma two times greater than the general population. That's a big difference. And it's directly showing that asbestos exposure is a concern. It remains a concern for firefighters. So the best way to really protect yourself from it is wearing your SCBA through all firefighter activities and especially through overhaul and gross decon and to not bring contaminated gear back to the station just to ensure that you're limiting those fibrous materials from being able to travel from the fire ground back to the station to other areas of your life. So with that, I'm gonna have Shannon cover legislation. Okay, thank you much. All right. So as Raquel mentioned, um, and is absolutely correct, there is no general ban on asbestos use in the United States. Um, in 1989, uh, the EPA did attempt a near total ban um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, they developed over 100,000 pages of evidence about the dangers that asbestos poses. Uh, everyone agreed it is a uh, cancer-causing agent. Um, there was plenty of testimony, but unfortunately, um, this attempt was struck down in the courts. The courts suggested, the courts demanded, um, that EPA prove a ban was the least burdensome alternative um, to other alternatives um, to regulate these, this substance. Um, 
which given the evidence against asbestos, some thought to be ridiculous. So EPA did move forward and banned certain uses of asbestos, right? So they are listed here, corrugated paper, roll board, commercial paper, specialty paper, a lot of paper, uh, flooring felt, and then new commercial uses after August 25th, 1989. Um, but other uses um, were still fair play. Um, subsequent to that, there was a patchwork of laws that were passed to try and get to some of these gaps. Clean Air Act banned asbestos uses in pipe insulation and block insulation in certain facilities and spray applied surfacing materials. Other bans in place through a patchwork of laws include artificial fireplace embers, wall patching compounds, filters in pharmaceutical manufacturing, processing, and packing. But what this does, you see there's a list of banned uses. There's a heck of a lot of uses that still persist. Um, so we're talking about the manufacture and importation of um, certain products such as vinyl tile floors or roof coatings, right? Or brake pads, if you think about the brake pads on certain cars or certain protective clothing like a fire blanket. Um, some of these products may still, contain, may still be manufactured with or be imported um, and containing asbestos. So the threat is definitely still there in new and current uses as well as um, some of these older uses prior to 1989. And so it still presents a threat to the firefighter. And because there's no general ban, um, some states have chosen to act, um, but state laws generally aren't relating to the ban of asbestos. They govern the removal, transportation, or disposal of asbestos, right? Trying to protect the consumer. If anyone's ever removed a popcorn ceiling from their homes or apartments, you know some states make you jump through hoops to get that done. Um, and those are the kinds of laws that we're referring to. Other states document exposures and require um, certain rec record keeping on that, um, but that, the states are limited in, in that manner um, on asbestos. So again, um, we talked about the certain uses of asbestos that is still permitted, and there's a lot of asbestos in the environment um, prior to the 1989 uh, limitations that were implemented. Um, so this is where our old friend Tosca comes in again, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Guess what's another chemical that the EPA decided to take a look at after Tosca was passed? Asbestos. It was actually one of the poster childs to get Tosca passed back in 2016. So um, in this instance, particularly, legacy asbestos is a real problem um, in that there is so much of it out there. And there's a lot of misinformation out there as well because the general population understands if it's in your popcorn ceiling or in the wall, it's not going to bother you. But guess what? As Raquel mentioned, when that catches fire or when you're doing overhaul, it's going to bother you, the firefighter, especially if you don't wear your um, SCBA. So EPA is currently conducting a risk assessment on asbestos, and this also is a many-year process. Um, and this is our bite at the apple to further regulate this product. We have the same arguments as we did for the flame retardant. Firefighters are a vulnerable subpopulation, and you need to uh, evaluate legacy asbestos. Same as the flame retardant, EPA rejected the legacy evaluation. That was overturned by the courts, and uh, now we are waiting to see what happens next. Um, so we've engaged here, as we did on the flame retardant, both uh, regulatorily lobbying the administration, and then Patrick Morrison has been testifying on Capitol Hill on this issue as well. Hmm. Another bill um, that folks in the room should be aware of to ban asbestos entirely. It's called the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, H.R. 1603, S. 717 in the Senate. And this would ban the manufacture, import, processing, and distribution of asbestos generally, right? So it gets at a lot of those holes in the patchwork of laws that we talked about. 
This bill has some movement behind it. It's been approved by the Committee on Energy and Commerce in the U.S. House of Representatives um, and is expected to be considered in the House uh, this year. Um, unfortunately, over in the Senate, um, the bill has support of Democrats but not support of Republicans. And because that is a Republican-controlled chamber, um, we anticipate this is going to be difficult moving this bill forward. There's a lot of folks on Capitol Hill that believe the action EPA is taking by a TOSCA is enough on this issue, and so they aren't in a hurry um, to move this general ban necessarily. Um, but the IAFF will continue advocating for this uh, legislation and um, hope for a better day um, for uh, its passage. And at, uh, there's, at this point, I'm gonna pass it back to Raquel to talk a little bit more about some of the other products that we're doing to protect uh, our firefighters from these chemicals. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So Shannon and I have just gone through three uh, toxic chemicals that you're all still exposed to on the job. And we want to kind of give you the power back, show you what you can do, what the IAFF is doing to really protect you guys and make sure you have as much information as possible. So to start, I mentioned before that the IAFF is doing a number of research projects. And here's kind of a brief of them, and I'm going to talk you through each one. So the first one we're doing is our PER and polyfluoroalkylized substances blood study. So we've taken three different departments, collected 200 uh, blood tests from structural firefighters, and their blood is now being analyzed for PFAS chemicals and the levels. So this will be really great to see what the structural firefighters have, what their levels are, compare them to the general population, and there's even the potential with the DOD firefighters to maybe even compare them to, to those levels as well. So this study is an initial one just to sort of see what the absorption is what's actually in the blood of the structural firefighters who maybe don't use the AFFF all the time to see if there are the exposures from, uh, from the consumer products and things like that. The next study we have is a two-part study. So it's our US and Canadian fire station flame retardant and PFAS dust study. So this started a while ago with the US fire station dust study. And they, we worked with 26 different departments and they vacuumed their station, and then researchers collected the vacuum dust and analyzed it for flame retardants. And that's how we know that flame retardants are, bringing back, are being brought back to the station. We've seen this in a number of different classes of flame retardants have been brought back, so we do know that that mode of transportation is there. And because of that, we wanted to replicate the study in Canada to see if the same thing's happening, if there's any differences in the design of the departments, to see if maybe carpeting has an effect versus no carpeting in your station and, and cleaning efforts and things like that. So, so we've replicated that study in Canada. And then we've taken the dust from both the Canadian and the US departments and we're reanalyzing it for PFAS chemicals now. So this will be really helpful to understand that mode of transportation. Is it something that does come from the dust? Is it traveling that way? Or if there's not much in the station, then we know that it's something that really stays on the fire ground or it's not a concern from in that like route with like the combustion byproduct and things like that. So, so, those, so that's that big study. And then our third study is a testing turnout gear for PFAS chemicals. So we've sent four brand new sets of gear to researchers and they're analyzing the gear for the PFAS chemicals and the levels in them. So we are really excited because we should hopefully be getting the results from these three studies in the next couple of months. And this will really help shape where the IAFF continues their research. We're gonna be able to see, is it, is it in the dust? Is it the blood? Is it the gear? Where do we really need to expand our research to better understand what the firefighters are exposed to, the routes of exposure, and then that way we can have a better picture of what's actually happening, especially because we know that flame retardants and asbestos are toxic, but PFAS is still somewhat of a mystery because there's such limited occupational studies on it that this is some of the newest research that's actually related to just firefighters. So these will be really exciting and we're, we can't wait to get the results back. So now that we sort of talked about what we're doing and there is a bit of a wait period just because research does take some time, but we wanted to kind of give you some best practices. 
So obviously we've talked about the foam. The foam is your non-polymeric forms of PFAS, your PFOA, your PFOS, especially if you have the C8 versions. And you know, the whole point of this is we want you to try to limit your exposure to the fluorinated AFFF as much as possible. So if you still have C8s, which it is possible because they're not banned, it was just manufacturers decided to shift away from producing them. So some of you may still have the C8s in your department and you can still use them. But we are recommending that you either switch to a C6 or fluorine free altogether. Obviously, Shannon mentioned with the mil spec, the military has to still use fluorinated uh, AFFF until, uh, until 2024 when they can use the fluorine free. So they have to use a C6. So we want you to sort of start shifting to the safer alternatives. Also, for training purposes, there's no reason to use fluorinated foam, so we want you to shift away from that. If you are going to use the fluorinated AFFF, we recommend trying to contain the water runoff. We know that AFFF is contaminating drinking water, especially on military bases, so that's something to really be cognizant of and to make sure that if you are going to use it, because there are still fires that you do need it for, and so if you are, just try to be cognizant of trying to protect the environment and preventing that water runoff. For you guys, when you are using it, make sure you wear full PPE and SCBA. Try to limit as much exposure as possible because we don't know the full scope of what inhalation and things like that. And then if you do come into contact, wash your turn out here according to manufacturer guidelines. So those are sort of the best practices. We want you to protect yourself. We want you to make sure that your gear isn't, doesn't get messed up from it. We want to make sure that you are not using something if you don't need to use it. We want the, the fluorinated foam to be used for necessary purposes. And then the, the last thing I leave you is our, um, is protecting yourself on the job. So I can't stress this enough when we talk about especially flame retardants and asbestos and a number of the other contaminants on the fire ground. It is important to wear your SCBA through all firefighting activities. This is through your fire suppression. This is through overhaul. This is through gross decontamination. The gas monitors only tell you when the gases are at a safe level. They're not telling you about the particulates. They're not telling you about the asbestos. And it's really important that you are protecting yourself through all of these different stages to limit your exposure to these chemicals because they do also off gas. So you need to make sure to do that. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about gross decontamination, it's really important to do it on scene. We don't want you bringing these contaminants back to the station. We don't want you to contaminate anything else. We don't want you to bring it home to your families. So we recommend wet decon over dry decon, as research shows that wet decon can remove up to 85% of the contaminants from your gear. Dry decon will only remove up to 23% of the contaminants. So wet decon is definitely more preferred, but obviously any decon is going to remove contaminants from your gear, and it's important to try to reduce that exposure as much as possible. And I know wet decon isn't always possible. I know that due with staffing and other issues, you know, doing what you can to minimize those exposures is super important. And we don't want you to take the contaminated gear into the cab. So after your decon, bag it, put it in an outside, cab, uh, an outside compartment, another vehicle, something like that. So it's not contaminating the cab, it's not in there, and you're not bringing that back to the station. And when you get back to the station, uh, we want you to shower and get the remaining contaminants off your body. So it's really important that you are doing the necessary stuff to protect yourselves on the job. We know that there's things you can't control. You're going to be exposed to these toxic chemicals, but there's a number of things you can do to really limit your exposures and to make sure that it's not something that's gonna stay on you and you're gonna be smelling it and you're gonna have it on you for a long time. We want you to really wear your SCBA to limit those exposures, clean your gear, don't bring it into the cab, and shower as soon as you get back to the station. So, and Shannon's gonna give you ledge. So just to put a little bit of a finer point on the research that Raquel is talking about, we are very excited for the results of that uh, research that we'll be seeing in the next couple of months, not just for the opportunity to better understand the issue and better understand the exposure and then do better and more research, right? 
but it also gives us data points that we can take to your legislators. We can make the argument, uh, all the arguments we've been making this whole time about the exposure to firefighters and then work on the necessary legislative solutions to re reduce exposure, make sure there's alternatives out there for you, whether we're talking about, um, you know, in uh, uh, atrial foam or what have you, and then um, that is also true at the state level, right? So that you can go back to your state level legislators and make the argument, look, here's this new study on PFAS. Um, this is you know, how we need to address it. Um, facts and figures like that are always convincing to elected officials. And so we're very pleased um, to be seeing the results of that as well. Um, the other federal issue that I'll mention really quickly before we move on to opportunities at the state level is that on PFAS in particular, we have partnered um, with the U.S. Fire Administration to put out um, uh, educational materials on PFAS, on the exposure to firefighters, and how firefighters can reduce their exposure. We're hopeful um, that that will be coming out in the near future um, at, on, a, at an electronic level um, and circulated to firefighters around the country. So um, be on the lookout for that. And then um, do share that with your colleagues um, at the station. Do share that with your colleagues uh, at your local. In the meantime, there's a lot that can be done uh, at the state level, right? So if you look at this map, these gray states here have no current law whatsoever on any of these three are, um, chemicals that we've talked about today. Um, and again, you can go to this website and take a look at um, if there's current proposals in the states and what the current status of the state laws is, or just shoot me an email and I can provide you information for your specific state. But there's a lot of opportunity here to address, you know, again, even some of these real low-lying fruit. When we were talking about labeling, right, that's an easy thing to do. When we were talking about banning, that's a little bit harder, but there's gradations in between um, that we can address. So there's opportunities for state associations and for IAFF members to um, pass laws in their own states. And even those green states, you have uh, those, that's only, that map is only reflective of one or two laws, perhaps. There's still opportunities in those states as well. Maybe one of those states has a law on PFAS, but not on flame retardants. You can fix that gap. So there's, we here at the IAFF can help you identify these gaps and craft creative solutions for solving them so you can reduce your exposure and reduce the exposure in your community. So whether it's banning a certain flame retardant or limiting any kind of toxic chemicals or limiting your exposure to PFAS, um, we can help you with that. Um, we can provide you with the legislative research or drafting assistance that you may need. Um, we just ask that you coordinate through your state association uh, as you proceed um, with this important work. And then we would advise um, that anyone who is looking to do this sort of work, you know, find some friendly legislators um, to work on it and coalition partners. Uh, we have partnered in the past with environmental groups, consumer groups, health advocates on these sorts, of, um, these sorts of things, and you find that they can be great force multipliers for your message and may have connections um, and reach uh, that uh, you lack and vice versa. Um, so building a coalition with these sorts of partners and pairing with friendly legislators um, who we can also help you identify uh, is, is a great way to start to address these issues uh, in your own state. And firefighters, you know, are a very powerful voice on this issue, so don't hesitate to get involved. Um, you'd be surprised at the difference you can make. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Pat, who's going to facilitate um, a little bit of conversation about these issues we've been talking about today. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. Um, I want to thank both of you, Raquel and Shannon. I think, you know, a round of applause is an excellent uh, presentation here this morning. They really did, they really did a nice job. Um, I'm going to open it up now. I have a couple co closing comments, but if anybody does have any questions here, um, please come up to the mic and ask that question. But before you do that, what I want to do is um, we have had a lot of questions on Facebook and YouTube. We are going to get to those to those uh, questions. We're going to try to answer every one of them if we can. 
with that. So those that uh, are watching, uh, we will have an opportunity once we get back to get the um, answers to those questions. Yes. And where are you from in your name, please? Robin Ganey with Local 122 in Jacksonville, Florida. During your presentations on your PFAS information, you mentioned that the IFF is looking into the PAFS materials in bunker gear construction. What's the, uh, what's the international doing to look into that and perhaps deal with that issue that's still, still an issue? Uh, as I mentioned, the third research project specifically is we've sent four brand new sets of PPE to researchers and they're actually pulling the materials apart and they're going to really be able to test each level to better understand what chemicals specifically are in it and what levels they are. And so that will sort of help show us if there, we can better understand the absorption and other aspects as well. So we're hoping that this is sort of a preliminary uh, preliminary study and then we can kind of expand on it because you know when this issue came out there's a lot of different aspects that we really wanted to tackle right away but we can only do so much at one time so we wanted to really focus on the certain main concerns and then see where else we can expand to. Yeah if I could just add to that I, if I could just add to that, um, there, uh, we were really excited also to be able to, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, secure the extra $2 million to study PFAS and firefighter personal protective equipment in last year's uh, congressional um, omnibus spending bill. Um, and so that, that research um, hasn't started yet um, as that money was only just appropriated, but should be uh, coming in the next year or so. And so we're excited to get started on that because it is it is such a huge concern, and we just don't have the um, uh, the the science behind it and the research behind it that we need. Um, so we're very hopeful that 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 work um, can help get us to the next step on that issue. Thank you, Crossy. Yes, best of us, Illinois Local Four Twenty Nine. <clears throat> when you were speaking about the PFAS, you were talking about the water runoff and the need to care for it. Um, has there been any concern about the fish and other wildlife that has been transferred to meat or vegetation? Uh, that is a concern. So that is part of it is we're finding that this chemical is a persistent and bioaccumulative one. So it's not breaking down in the environment. It's staying forever. So that is why the long chain specifically are what has been evaluated so far. And those are the ones that we're seeing in the drinking water and can af affect the wildlife as well. Um, I'm not too versed in it just because I'm looking more for the occupational exposures, but I do know that that is a concern mainly for the environmental community. And so that's why it is important to prevent the runoff because you know, we're seeing that the AFFF is contaminating the, the drinking water for the communities around them as well. So thank you. Good morning, uh, Vic Dillabaugh from Ottawa, Canada, Local 162. I'm, uh, I have a question regarding the uh, studies that the IFF is assisting in with uh, looking at PFAS. And my, my understanding is that a lot of that research is already being done, uh, specifically by Dr. Peasley at, at Notre Dame University. Um, my understanding, too, with the side chain uh, polymers is that they can break off and degrade during washing. And I'm wondering if you could answer any questions on that. Um, so I'll start with the, with the other research being done. With any type of research, it is always good to have multiple researchers do the same thing. You want to make sure that the, the results from one person are being replicated appropriately, or being replicated. So you know that the study is reliable and that the information is accurate. Um, as for the, the side chains, uh, we have heard that there's a potential for it to break off. I don't know enough about what that really means long term. Is it, is it 10 years that it might break off or something like that? So that's one that, you know, through a lot of the research that we're doing, it'll provide us better insight as to what is actually happening. But at this time, I just, I don't know that answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I guess. My, my only other question would be with regards to if there's studies out there, are, are we considering those two? Are we looking at those seriously? Because I think that, that this is a, a serious uh, health concern for us. And uh, with, with regards to, I mean, I uh, was able to get in touch with Dr. Peasley 
and, uh, and go through some of his uh, research. And, and there's definitely some out there. It's been replicated. It's great that you guys are trying to replicate it through other studies as well. I think that's important, but I think we need to be concerned about it. Absolutely, and we are, any research done by other researchers, we are, we are collecting it, we're reviewing it, we make sure that, uh, that we really are taking it in, and we do use other researchers' research as well as our own, so a lot of times we might base our own projects off of other ones. So. Yeah, no, thank you, those were some great questions, and we are, I mean, we take this stuff, um, I can't tell you how serious we take this, and I think there are a lot of people out there to think that we're not doing what we need to do or we're not going into the, that direction in some of these chemicals out here. And I can just tell you, from the general president, from health and safety, we have been on the forefront of cancer in the fire service way before any other organization even came around. Uh, we were the only ones that put line of duty death on those cancers that we knew were being caused by the fire ground on our memorial. And we take that, we take that very, very serious. We take all our studies serious. But at the same end, we want to make sure that we do have the empirical evidence. We do have that research. And we will make the right decision. And we are inclusive. We look at those studies. We have reached out to, to many people on here. We have blood samples right now at CDC being checked for PFAS. We want to look at what's going on in this room. We haven't, we haven't even studied the effects of, after on overhaul, all the uh, flame uh, PFAS and flame retardants in that house. How are they affecting us? What, why are they affecting us? And we're going to continue to do this. The IFF is not going to skirt the issue. We're not, and we work with a lot of partners. We do. We're even working with industry. We're trying to work with them in a constructive way to say, OK, are there safer alternatives? And, but we have to remember, when we did flame retardants, there was always a safer alternative. They just changed one molecule, and we had something else. So in flame retardants, it went from penta to octa, octa to deca. All of them were carcinogenic, but they played the shell game. They, t they took one molecule, and we were in Washington State where it started with our firefighters in there in the state. They started that, and that spread around the country, and we were able to identify those flame retardants. We're going to do this. This is just not one. There are multiple amounts of chemicals. We talked about asbestos. We talked about um, that is our high mesothemioma, two times greater than the general population. And you know why we don't talk a lot about it? Because on a study, on a NIOSH study, that we actually were part of commissioning that study with Philly, with Chicago, and with San Francisco, we, looked, we went back and looked at death certificates because there's a latency period there. And, and we're going to go back and look at our presumption laws. We are testifying in every single state. We are having legislation in every single state. So all I want to kind of close with here is that we take this very, very seriously. The health and safety. When we were formed back in 1918, that was the primary charge for us health and safety. And if we can't do health and safety, then we shouldn't be in this business. And we take it very, very seriously. We're going to continue to do it. We're going to continue to protect our members. We're going to continue with this research. And we're going to find those ways to reduce the, the cancer in the fire service. We work with a lot of partners out there. We're going to continue to do that. I want to thank again Raquel and Shannon for your, your assistance in here. It was a great presentation information. And I want to thank all of you that came. This is not one of those great topics that you're going to come in, but you came, you chose to do this. And those that are wa watching out there, thank you for this. And I appreciate the time and the effort that everybody has put in for this, and there's more work to continue, and we will continue it on behalf of our members' health and safety. So thank you, and have a sa safe travels back home to where you go.